Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our final installment of the Hen House at Home for 2021. I'm Toby Harper. Oh, and I'm Monica Fernandez. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> and thank you so much for joining us to celebrate our fall 2021 authors and their incredible books. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge that the land that Monica and I are broadcasting from is the occupied and seized territory of the Gabrielino, Tonga, and Keech people. Tonight's event celebrates New Moons, an anthology edited by Kazim Ali, highlighting contemporary writing from North American Muslims. So we wanted to share an anthology highlighting work by Indigenous writers as well. Native Voices, Indigenous American Poetry, Craft, and Conversations, edited by Seamary Furman and Dean Rader, is a comprehensive collection of the most urgent Indigenous American poetry and prose spanning the mid-20th century to today. This is certainly a book that should be on everyone's shelves alongside New Moons. So please pick up your copy today. Uh, link's being dropped now. We are so excited for this event tonight and we are celebrating the release of New Moons with a party, a virtual party. Uh, the anthology features over 60 Muslim identifying writers from across North America. And we are proud to play a part in ushering this vital book into the world. It has been such a delight to be able to share these writers work and I'm so glad it's been resonating with so many people already. Before we get started, we also wanted to encourage all of you viewers to go out and get a copy of this, anth this anthology. You'll get free shipping if you buy a copy from redhenpress.org before November 16th. Dropping a link for that now. And to say more about the anthology and to MC this mega reading with 23 New Moons contributors, please welcome New Moons editor, Kazem Ali. Thank you. Um, thank you, Toby and Monica, and thank you, Red Han. And um, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Uh, I'm joining you from San Diego, California, the uh, traditional lands of the Kumeyaay people. We're so excited for this anthology. Um, it is not the first anthology of Muslim writers, but it is the first broad um, uh, anthology, including poetry, fiction, nonfiction from Muslims of, as I call them, all stripes. I mean, practicing Muslims, secular Muslims, cultural Muslims, former Muslims, converts, reverts, uh, bad Muslims, <laughs> good Muslims. Um, we really wanted to bring in between covers um, a representation of all of the richness, um, richnesses of our community, all kinds of writing, um, all ages, uh, Muslims across barriers of nation, gender, sexuality, uh, gender identity, um, completely representing the incredible um, diversity and richness of our community. As we know, um, Muslims have been in the West for many, many hundreds of years. Um, the Europeans that arrived to settle this continent um, you know, came here, Muslim people were among them, of course, uh, in the form of uh, Spanish uh, settlers and in the form of enslaved African labor. And so we've had a Muslim presence in the countries of the West since that time. And of course the encounter with the indigenous has been, you know, complicated and messy as, it, as, as the settlement of this continent was. But what, why I bring that up is I want us to really recognize, embrace and acknowledge that Muslim contributions to American culture, um, literature, architecture, music, um, um, art, it has all been there from the very beginning. It's not new, in other words. Um, when Michelle Obama, you know, famously, you know, said, I, grow, I wake up in a house built by slaves, it was M Muslim people who were the laborers who were here in the, in the earliest days from West African um, enslaved labor. So we've, we have a long, we have a long and time honored tradition in this country. And I just want to read one single paragraph from the introduction to this uh, uh, anthology that I think really represents uh, who, you know, what, what we're trying to do with this anthology. Uh, so, uh, of course, Muslim writing in North America is older than anyone supposes. Most, if not all, of the first West Africans who lived here brought as enslaved labor were practicing Muslims and had been for hundreds of years before their capture. And the Islam that they practiced was generational, sophisticated, and infused with a deeply African spiritual and philosophical framework. 
to my mind, the theology of liberation that drove Southern Black Christianity as it was practiced among enslaved African populations from their arrival through the civil rights movement and present day has at its roots in deeply foundational liberation theology of original Islam. In fact, Islam at its heart and its foundation, at its fundament, one might say, is a cosmopolitan, multicultural, multilingual, anti-capitalist, feminist, friendly to alternative family and community structures, and radical in its approach to questions of religious and political authority. So radical, in fact, that within years of the passing of the prophet and the original generation of teachers, what Muslims call his companions, the ruling classes of the era had fully co-opted the teachings, eliminated the democratic oral transmission of scripture by canonizing a written version of the Quran and destroying all variants and marginalized or murdered most of the teachers who taught alternative doctrines to what was approved by the political elite ruling from first Damascus and then Baghdad and later Cairo. It was not until the ascendance of hundreds and at the ascendance hundreds of years later of the more socially liberal Western Caliphate in Al-Andalus that Islam began to once more resemble the Islam of its earliest days. That's just a little flavor of the, some historical context uh, around where we're going. And that Western Caliphate, by the way, it, you don't learn it in school, but they are responsible for what we call the Renaissance. And the reason was the Renaissance came about because of the reintroduction of all the old Greek and Latin texts that were lost, that were not being available in, 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 to the common people of Europe because the priesthood of the Catholic Church, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church did not allow these documents to be translated from Greek or Latin into the vernacular languages. And that translation happened in Toledo in Spain. And it was the Arab scholars who were taking the Arab versions of Aristotle, Homer, all, those, all of those texts, they came into French, Spanish, Portuguese, English from the Arabic. So the, uh, the Al-Andalus Caliphate was responsible for that. Muslims were responsible for that. So when we called this anthology New Moons, it meant to say the new moon is in the sky and it has an impact nonetheless. You don't see it, you don't know it's there, but it is there, you know? And so that's who new moons are, Muslim writers in the West. We've always been here and we've always had an impact on the culture of the West and on, on American and Canadian culture. So we have a great series of readings tonight uh, some incredible writers from the anthology, poets, storytellers, fiction writers. I can't wait to hear them. And we're gonna hear first from Dilruba Ahmad, uh, uh, who is the author of two wonderful books of poetry, Bring Now the Angels, uh, her most recent book, and then her debut book, Dakha Dust. Welcome, Ruba. Thank you, Kazem, for that introduction. And um, thank you to Monica and Toby and Redhead Press. I'm so honored to be here um, as part of this launch event for New Moons. And I can see already that this is a collection that's going to be a very important home for me and for my work. I'm going to read two poems from the anthology. And the first one is a retelling of the tale of Jack and the Beanstalk. It's called Choke. Was there a beanstalk, a golden egg laying hen? No, just a magic seed, a courtyard of crooked men. Was there a giant? There must always be a giant. In how many ways did the giant try to choke you? He did not attempt this with his bare hands. In how many ways did the giant try to choke you? He didn't choke me. He choked the competition, flooded the market with magic seeds. Was magic involved? How else could he ensure economic chokehold? How else the power to ban sales of nature's seeds? Was magic involved? How else could he choke off a normal trade flow? How else, in revitalization's name, a new world economy? What life were you doomed to live? Must there always be doom in the developing world? What life were you doomed to live? Lifetime poverty, I was told. How did you pay 1,000 for your first bag of seeds? Alone, 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 alone. Forgive me, my children, my wife, alone. How did you know the seeds were enchanted? They only grow once. My pockets emptied without end. 
and what of the pesticides? The giant implied the magic seed has little need. Save your rupees, save your children. What did the seeds grow? Nothing, every time. How many times did you try? Too many, then I took my life. Who weeps now over the blighted fields? My wife, my children, my God, what could I do? How many witnessed you drinking the pesticide? On our first date, we secretly strolled and tossed scraps to birds. What did the giant say when you died? From his heights, will he notice the smell of blood? Be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. Who will pay the loans now that you're dead? Please tell the world what is happening here. And my second poem is uh, called Snake Oil, Snake Bite. And this one uh, was the very first poem I wrote when I realized I was working on a new manuscript. So it's the last poem in my second collection, but it's actually the first uh, that I wrote. Um, and I just wanna say thanks again for everyone who's here and um, thanks to everyone involved in the anthology. Snake Oil, Snake Bite. They staunched the wound with a stone. They drew blue venom from his blood until there was none. When his veins ran true, his face remained lifeless and all the mothers of the village wept and pounded their chests until the sky had little choice but to grant their supplications. God made the boy breathe again. God breathes life into us, it is said, only once. But this case was an exception. God drew back in a giant gust and blew life into the boy. And like a stranded fish, he shuddered, oceanless. It was true, the boy lived. He lived for a very long time. The toxins were an oil slick, contaminated, clean. But just as soon as the women kissed redness back into his cheeks, the boy began to die again. He continued to die for the rest of his life. The dying took place slowly, sweetly. The dying took a very long time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruba, for that beautiful reading. <laughs> what incredible poems and so glad to have them in the anthology. We're gonna hear next from Denzila Ahmad. Taz, uh, I love this woman so much. <laughs> I, don't know her, I don't know her. I don't know her very, extremely well, but I know her enough to know that I want to know her more. Uh, she is such a generous human. She's a political activist, a storyteller, a poet, and an artist um, based in Los Angeles. Uh, she has turned out over 500,000 Asian American voters. I mean, that is just incredible work. And she's a person who connects her art making um, practices with her political commitments. And I just have the deepest respect for that. I'm so glad to have you here with us today. Take it away. Thank you so much. Um, I usually do nonfiction essays or poetry. Um, so this is kind of new for me. I did, a, I did a speculative nonfiction. I believe that's what this is called. It's called Muslima Fight Club. Um, I'm just gonna jump in. We would meet in dirt-filled backyards and empty warehouses. We'd meet weekly, a mishmash of Muslimas who all felt the need to prepare given the current regime change. In the group, I had secretly gathered the leader of a Desi rock band, an activist hijabi, an amateur fighter writer, and more, and more about 10 women in total. These were all people I adored. Most I'd met through organizing on community causes. Many I stood side by side with at protests. These were my ride or die in this fight. It was the first time though, I was sure that B had been surrounded by so many Muslim women. He was unfamiliar with the customs and the culture, but he didn't care. He was here to provide a service. Here, take this, the instructor B handed me a rubber blade. My fingers tingled as I grasped the handle. It was black, about four inches long with a blade that would bend. In my hand, it felt heavy, weighted. I glanced around. She was holding a flashlight and she was holding a two foot long wooden stick. 
We were all holding different types of weapons as we prepared to train. I pretended to stab myself with the rubber blade in my arm. It might not cut, but it would bruise. It felt real. It was real. We Muslimas stood in a line, breathed it into the ground, and then breathed it into the air. Deep breaths, grounding our existence. Then we walked side by side, taking steps in a triangle as we found our center. And then we learned to fight. I had never felt so alive. The regime change meant people that looked like me were on the news a lot. The Nazis were emboldened by the anti-Muslim dog whistles of their leader. Through the encrypted text messaging app and secret groups, we'd share links to stories of Muslimas getting attacked. There was a story of the young hijabi woman on the subway in Portland where two men died from being stabbed, protecting her from Islamophobes. There was the elderly Bangladeshi auntie that was walking on NYC streets who was stabbed as her husband walked behind her. A woman's hijab was pulled back before she was attacked with a knife. Each secret fight club session felt more urgent than the last as these incidences were fresh on our mind. Each class was adjusted based on the trauma in the news that week. After the hijab pull a hate crime, we learned how to turn quickly so that we would use a scarf as a weapon. There were rumors that Nazis were going to show up at protests prote protecting the rights of Muslims. The class after that, we learned how to wield the protest sign as a weapon. I didn't want fear to drive me, but I didn't know what being driven by love looked like. All I knew was that I was scared and my friends were scared and people that looked like us were scared. What I didn't expect was how full of love and adoration I felt for the Muslimas in Fight Club after each class. I loved them so much that I knew I'd wield a knife for them if they needed me to. It was Asata Shakur that said, we must love each other and protect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. In this time of strife, though this started as a mission to combat fear, I found myself in the depths of a different kind of falling in love. A secret sisterhood of the Muslimas had been formed. When we crossed paths in public, like at parties or at protests, we didn't acknowledge how we were secretly meeting each other weekly. Other people could sense the bond that had been created between us, but no one knew why. How could they? A Muslima girl gang learning to knife fight was beyond their comprehension. Muslimas were supposed to be meek, objects, submissive, but we didn't need them to know otherwise. This was our little secret. I'm gonna end it there. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be a part of this project. Thank you. Thank you, Taz. Speculative nonfiction, huh? Speculative. There isn't actually a fight club, is that what you're telling me? <laughs> we'll just let that be the story, okay? The official story. Um, we're going to hear next. So we have three poets in a row. That's great. We are going to hear from multiple um, people writing different kinds of genres, but I'm super excited actually to hear uh, Sara Ghazal Ali, who is the next reader. Um, she's a Bay Area poet and she's the editor in chief of Palette Poetry. Um, she obtained her MFA in poetry from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where Aga Shahid Ali taught for, for many, many years. So please welcome her. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's such an honor and a privilege to be included in this gorgeous anthology that, can I also say, has the best cover of anything ever. Cover is so beautiful. Um, I'll read two poems. Um, the first from the anthology and then one outside of it. So the first one that's in the beautiful anthology is called Self-Portrait as Body Written for God. If he cuts off my fingers, I will count your names, eyelash by eyelash, breath by breath. How can I pretend I am blameless, unsullied, with this body of clay, the dirt there beneath my nails for all to see? Nissa is working on folding her tongue proportional to truth. As is, my body is adjacent earnest, reluctant to bend, but perfect in form for those fleeting moments of humility. God gave man a script, but still I pull words from air, beg in some vernacular, curve everything but my spine. Nissa writes of the beloved, but forgets to write to him. She says in our abandoned tongue, forgive me, I tell everyone else what I hide from you. 
And then the second poem is called Theophanies. If nothing else, at least this clemency, two worlds in each face, round pistols borrowed and searching. Tharik asks what I saw in my sleep. I weave a sweet lie about my mother's pomegranates, the kitchen tiles we bloodied, digging for the seed in each rumored to belong to a mirror tree in paradise. The truth, a girl with melting eyes who holds my gaze all night, vitreous rivers gushing down our faces until one of us wakes. There is no unseeing it, the white stick and clotted erupting into weeds where they fall by my feet. My people don't share what darkness we've seen. Fear always a message from the devil. Tharik says true dreams reveal themselves at the first inhale of sunrise. How to hold wide my eyes for the ineluctable light. On a disappeared horizon, a bush continues to burn, a lilied cervix swarms green, and Jacob is still sightless, 40 years lost to grief. Clouds drone above me, my two ordinary eyes sealed in sleep. Every vision is redolent and terrible. Every temporal sight, either a miracle or a mistake. Thank you again so much for putting this together. Thank you, Asara, for that beautiful reading. I mean, I'm really expecting those people who are in this anthology who have not yet published a book, I'm gonna be keeping my eye on you. So <laughs> you keep me posted about things. Our next reader is Barak al -Zaid. He's coming in from Thailand. Um, so thank you for waking up at you know five in the morning to be with us today. We're really excited about to have you here. He's a writer, um, artist and curator and his work in progress is called Fabulous, which is a memoir about his queer coming of age in Kuwait. Um, and he was a 2018 Lambda Literary Retreat Fellow. And uh, Lambda is of course a uh, organization very dear to my heart. So <laughs> glad to know about that. Take it away, Barack. I'm good. Thank Look you. Work. Repping the mug. <clears throat> Repping the Lambda mug. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really just been enjoying being part of this community. It's something that I would never have imagined um, having grown up being somebody who really loved being Muslim and then somebody who really uh, loathed uh, the association uh, and having this as part of the healing process with the religion and the culture has really been fantastic. I'm reading an excerpt from the memoir that is published in uh, the New Moons uh, anthology. My collection of illustrated Islamic picture books share a shelf with the mythological exploits of the Greeks, brimming with dreamers and prophets, parables of right and wrong. I had arranged the books chronologically by prophet from Sayyidina Adam to Sayyidina Muhammad, and today I was mulling over Sayyidina Yusuf for a religion class quiz. The cover of his volume depicts the story's climax. Two women loomed over a table of fruit. One looked horrified. The knife she held was covered in her own blood, the deep red of henna. The other woman bowed her head, cheeks flushed. The faces and bodies of our prophets are left to our imagination. And I imagined him graceful in, gracefully entering that hall, handsome eyes flashing at the scene. Baba and I studied side by side at my desk and every so often his legs absentmindedly knocked into mine. I looked over, annoyed at the constant touch and realized I was sitting much taller compared to last spring when we studied at this table together. Desire and longing define Sayyidina Yusuf's story. His brothers vying for the affections of their father cast their younger brother into a well. My voice rose and then cracked into its lower register. Why didn't he know his brothers would do that to him if he could see the future? Like Tiresias or the Oracle of Delphi, this prophet was an interpreter of dreams. It didn't matter whether Baba was lecturing me to be nice with the people or if he was talking on the phone, his voice always boomed. 
Allah give for him a gift, but it came after many tests to his faith. His brother's very jealous, but he had faith in Allah, so he rescued. Baba pressed his finger into the spine of my workbook to flatten the pages. My eyes wandered instead to another passage in my, my illustrated book. After Sayyidina Yusuf was rescued, he fell into the employ of a high-ranking official in Pharaoh's court, eventually encountering the official's wife, Sulikha. She watched Sayyidina Yusuf, and I imagined her advancing on him, her nails clinging tight to his shirt, tearing away a fragment as he tried to escape her reach. I lingered inside this vision, as she must have lingered on the top muscles stretching across his back as he reached for the door. After knocking my knees together for a few minutes, I was very aware of the warmth gathering in the seat of my pants. I pulled at the threads of hair that had settled along my chin over the summer. I'd been nagging Mama for a razor and shaving cream, and she kept saying I had to ask Baba. Baba noticed I was distracted and tapped his palm on the table. Better you read the textbook for the exam. What do you need from these childish things? Since religion class was bilingual, Baba could get away with us reading Quran in Arabic and doing summaries in English. So I followed along with each syllable and stumbled over the vowels. Diacritic marks on the consonants were signposts to meaning, but I often missed them. A relic of jumping from government school to an American school. Baba, what does Balagha mean? He squinted. He become a man. This was my first ever real opening to the puberty conversation with Baba. I ignored my churning stomach and thought carefully of how to ask him to teach me to shave. A couple of years ago, Mama had tossed an illustrated guide to puberty into my room and walked off. Let us know if you have any questions. Which part of the puberty guide talked about how to ask your dad about the changes going on in your body? The Maghrib prayer pierced through my windows and interrupted my tangential thoughts. The Mu'adhan must have been sick from the recent dust storms because this evening's adhan was throaty and rattled with phlegm. Soon Baba would rush to pray. If I could just shave, my hair could grow thicker. But before I could say anything, Baba's dishdasha swished out the door, leaving behind woody notes of cologne. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, exciting excerpt. It leaves one wanting to read the full, the full project. Um, our next reader is Aya Bande Ahmadi, and her forthcoming memoir and stories, Ayat, was a finalist for the First Pages Prize and the Chautauqua Foundation's Janus Prize. So that's a, um, impressive, and it probably means that we're going to see that book really soon. Uh, inshallah, as, the, as one says. Uh, and, and I just wanted to take a moment to just say, I has been so active since the beginning um, in um, helping us to you know, figure out ways of promoting the anthology and organizing readings. And uh, it's really, really wonderful. So thank you for all of that work and we really appreciate it. And I'm really looking forward to hearing you um, read your work. So take it away. It's been my pleasure to be part of this community. I think um, I've said this feels like going to mosque the way you know you say going to church and I would love to see this just like blossom and grow. So I'm going to read a piece um, from this memoir and stories and that took place I think 20 years ago uh, down the street from where Red Hen um, exists on Lake Boulevard in Pasadena and um, in this collection I write about myself in the third person because it's my way of taking ownership of the stories that um, I imagine or that other people have told about me. Excuse me, a voice asks from the crowd of shoppers as Aya hurries down the gold flecked sidewalks of Pasadena's Lake Boulevard to deposit some checks in the Caltech Student Union account at Bank of America. The CND blonde middle-aged woman gesturing at Aya is wearing khaki shorts and a worn pastel tee, revealing her sunburned decolletage. A shorter woman with pudgy cheeks and mouse brown hair, wearing denim shorts and a white tank top accompanies her. Yes, Aya responds. She removes her sunglasses and studies both the women to see what they might want. You're not Muslim, are you? The first woman asks. Aya's bare shoulders prickle in her forever 21 tank top. She looks down at her pink flip-flops with faux flower petals and blue jeans. Her pink and white headscarf is wrapped around her head. Yes, she answers. 
you're naked. I know how you're supposed to cover up. I've been over there. I've been to Saudi. You're just wearing that headscarf for show. Look at you. While this kind of admonishment would be normal at home from her mom or dad, she's surprised to hear it out loud from here, from someone here like this. Her heart starts racing. She considers telling the woman her family is from Iran, but trembles with uncertainty instead. I almost married a sheik while I was there, the woman continues as her friend looks on. They all love me there. They just love blondes. They have so much money, you wouldn't believe it. It's because of you I'm not married to one now. They all want someone who wears a veil they can bring home to mom, and you're all frauds. You think you can wear a veil and go break all the rules. The woman senses Aya's disbelief and adds, I was going to put on the veil and do everything by the rules once I got married. When you marry a sheik, you have to follow the rules. But I'm going to go back, and I will marry a sheik. Aya's chest pounds visibly above her square neckline of her gray tank top. She can't imagine someone wanting to subject themselves to all the judgment of being married to a sheik. I'm not Saudi and I've never been to Saudi Arabia and I don't want to marry a sheik. It doesn't matter, you're still a fraud. The woman grabs at the cleavage spilling above her neckline, cupping it, raising her voice. Aya considers if she's really a fraud. Why else would her outfit make people interrupt such a beautiful day to accost her? She considers suggesting that the woman is showing at least as much skin in her shorts. Every time a sensible argument comes to mind, a sickening feeling in the pit of her stomach tells her the woman won't take it well. Maybe, she thinks to herself, she miscalculated with her outfit, with her confidence in the idea that young people are supposed to be allowed to experiment in college as long as they're not hurting anyone, or who she's supposed to be with whom. Maybe the rules are different for her. You're like this. The woman interrupts, her face full of rage, hands grabbing at her own cleavage. Aya searches for the right words. The woman reaches into her coral tee with both hands and grasps her left breast. An aureola appears, then a nipple. Hearing the shouting, passerby have begun to stop and watch from a distance. Aya wonders if maybe someone will step in to help. She wonders if she deserves help. Or if the situation reads as an encounter between two tawdry characters not worth getting involved with. She wonders if she looks cheap and desperate to all the strangers. If she looks like she's trying too hard. You're like this, the woman shrieks, jiggling her visible breast with both hands to emphasize the point. The words finally come with ease. You're the one who's naked. The statement registers first in the woman's eyes and then her posture. The woman's hands press her bare breast back into the coral top. Aya doesn't wait for more questions. She walks away, maintaining her gait for almost two blocks, then glances around to see if anyone's staring at her. The world goes on about its day. Noticing this, she slips her cardigan back on. She continues, still trembling, towards Bank of America. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for that reading. I, uh, I'm looking forward to your book also coming soon. Um, our next uh, reader is Rami Alatrebi, um, and he is a queer Muslim Arab American theater artist, performer, storyteller, and educator based in Los Angeles. His solo theater show, The Ride, played an acclaimed run at the Hollywood Fringe Festival in 2019 and earned him the Encore Producers Award. So I'm really uh, excited to uh, hear from you, Rami. We don't have your voice yet. We're still muted. Are you multitasking right now? <laughs> Do we have Rami's voice? Do we have his audio? I think it's coming. I heard something. Oh no. Okay. We lost him. Yes, we did. All Crying. right. And <laughs> it's in the middle. Maybe it's part of the performance. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna, we'll see, we'll, we'll try to get Rami back and we'll come back to him, okay? <laughs> that was very dramatic. Uh, we're gonna go on to our next reader. I think Rami, Rami's just coming back. Oh, yeah, is Rami coming back? 
I do believe so. And I think he just, um, I think he just parked. So <laughs> <laughs> um, we had discussed this before. He was like, I'm going to be driving. And I was like, can you get somewhere to park? Um, let's see. He needs to start his video. Are we back with Rami? Hey, can we hear you, Rami? This might not be the best time, huh? <laughs> let's see if we have audio from Rami. Still don't hear anything. Ah, oh, his way past me. All right, Rami, how about we, let's see, we come back to you so that you get to a safe place. We don't want you to, uh, we don't want you to be come too back to Rami, everybody. Yeah. We're going to continue, but we're going to come back to him. Uh, we're going to hear from another uh, really exciting um, uh, poet whose work I am um, very glad to have learned about through the anthology, and that is Farah Ghafour. And she is, uh, her poems are forthcoming or published in Room, Ninth Letter, uh, and uh, a previous anthology of Muslim writing. I told you ours is not the first one. Um, the previous anthology of Muslim writing, Halal If You Hear Me, that came out from Haymarket Books in 2019. And she is the editor in chief of Sugar Rascals magazine and currently a student at the University of Toronto, one of my other hometowns. So welcome, welcome. Hi, everybody. My name is Farah. And um, it's just such an honor to be included among so many amazing writers and so many people I look up to. I wish I had um, this anthology along with Halal If You Hear Me when I started writing. It would have really helped me, actually. <laughs> So I'm going to be reading two poems. The first, one, the first one is called End of the World Poem. I love the fearsome crocodile as much as you love the fearsome sun. We both know your darling may very well be plotting our demise with its own in a couple million years. And all of us face missiles shy as white vans. And when noticed, we wave like supermodels before paparazzi. So until it kills us, I will love the failed rocket of the crocodile propelling itself entirely out of water using only its tail. See how it falls and breaks water and the water laughs. Its mouth mother-like at this surprising birth and takes further suggestions from the earth carrying us in, in its flesh. We must love and love and love until us dead things fall and ferment and decompose and grow grass as part of our new aesthetic. Goneness is charged guilty for interrupting goodness, but really this is only evolution. Goodness eats us up, and in our abstractions, we lay by the riverbed, watching the crocodile drift closer and ask for its opinion. In its belly, the phoenix recites poems of the crocodile's beauty whilst teaching us to stir ashes. All of us here in this moment die at the same rate, look slow and stubborn as planets as your funny sun dictates. And the redwoods grow to the lowest heaven of the galaxy, urging purity for our souls. And the scientists shout that the lowest heaven keeps expanding, urging Godspeed to our souls. The Quran says that stars are lamps and decorations and weapons to be thrown at devils. And the sun infuriated says, please ask for my opinion. Us deathless things eavesdrop and share our own tragic backstories and unremarkable futures and sing the song of life we have yet to forget, the song of stomach acid and things that glint like glass to replenish. I know only of what the chambers of our hearts had learned of the world after completing their, their degrees in awe. And the second poem is called How to Talk White. How my head was blown, blank and immobile. How my white friend turned to me twice, her mouth filled with glee and glass and noise splintering into my face. How a brown boy's mouth dropped stole, stolen sonnets of rolled R's and tough T's. How they belonged to his parents, his grandparents, my parents, my grandparents. Their clouded reflections crashing like teeth 
breaking on contact like rain in a public winter. How his grin stretched irreparably, mocking for the white woman in front of the room. How he bowed, famished for applause like a dog, like a matador in the ring, the room a coliseum. How loved a sport, a game, fanatics displaying the colors they love on their thick skins. How a series of spears were drawn like breath, burrowing into the bull skin, the skin thought to be thick. How it charges into a white open mouth, a sheet to cover a determined animal, a person with when it died. How humiliated, naked. It's funny, they aren't talking white. Ah, I mean right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for that beautiful reading. Um, we're going to hear next from a contributor who I was actually not live on the call with us, but she sent us a video uh, of her work. Uh, and that's Hilal Isler. Um, and her writing has appeared in the Paris Review Literary Hub and the Los Angeles Review of Books in other venues. So Monica, I think you have the video. Uh, there we go. Do we have sound on that? Oh, no. All right, let me figure that out. Um... <laughs> There's sound. All right, oh. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Halal Eisler, Hilal Ishlam Turkish. I'm one of the contributors to the anthology mm -hmm. New Moons out on Red Hen Press now. I'm not going to read my piece because I don't think I can do it in under three minutes, but I did want to show you my face and introduce the piece and say that I wrote it about my time in Philadelphia immediately after September 11. Uh, I'm so excited that this anthology exists. So thank you to everybody at Red Hen Press and Kazumali for pulling us all together and showing really the richness and diversity of experience within the North American Muslim community. Thank you. Thank you so much to Halal, and hopefully we'll have her at um, at one of the future readings that's um, that's coming down um, down the list. Um, do we have Rami back, or should we continue on and come back to him later? Monica, do you know Rami? Um, do not see Rob. No, I don't think that we have. We'll just keep going, and then oh wait. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he seems to like know when we're talking about him. He literally just popped on. Oh, Rami, are you with us back? Do we have audio from you? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hold on. Let me I, call it. I went to park somewhere, so it'll be easier. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Um, Yay, I'm, so sorry glad about, you I'm sorry about that. No worries. So glad you're here. Go on. <laughs> Um, I'm not, I just wanted to share a little bit. I'm not going to read anything because, well, for lots of reasons, one, I was driving, but second, my piece in the, in the anthology is a piece of drama. Um, and there are multiple characters, four characters. So, um, I would need like four actors to, to, to share. Um, so I'm, figuring out how to do that for future readings that will be happening in LA. So, uh, but, but me just reading four characters, that's not going to be a very good representative of the work. Um, but I want to say that I'm really like honored to be a part of this because, uh, and for Kazim to actually have, I, you know, suggested that I do write a piece of drama, um, that I am a theater artist and I have written my own work, but I've never had, I've never written a piece of dramatic fiction before. And I really liked to, I like the challenge and I, I'm grateful that I'm actually now a published dramatist because of this book. Um, it's uh, exciting for me. And uh, also um, this was a good opportunity to uh, do something different. I normally do some memoir based stuff. I talk a lot about my queerness and being Muslim. And this piece of work uh, was a, is a departure from that. It's not really about queerness at all, um, but uh, about, um, other like politics around being a Muslim in America. Uh, the piece uh, that I wrote um, is was inspired by 
sort of, you know, when a few years ago, when, you know, that family, the, the cons who were at the Democratic National Convention for Hillary Clinton and how, you know, they lost their son because he was fighting in Afghanistan and how they used sort of the fact that they that their son served in the military and the fact that he lost his life as evidence that they were good Americans. And I really, really had a problem with that narrative. And so I wrote a piece of drama that sort of was inspired by that and um, feels pretty relevant, you know, um, in light of just the political uh, atmosphere out there. And I'm just really proud of it, really proud that it's part of this, really proud that there's a piece of drama in there. And I'm just grateful for uh, to Kazim and uh, to everybody uh, for, for allowing this book to exist. Thank you so much, Rami, for that heartfelt um, conversation. And I wanna add something, which is that, you are one of the pathbreaking artists of our future, one of the pathbreaking writers who will create this drama, these dramas, write these dramas for future generations of audiences to see and for future generations of Muslim actors and actors to have roles, have important roles. So it's, you know, Toby and I were having a conversation about this anthology just the other day about how an anthology comes to be and how much work it is to do this stuff. And we always come up with this question of who who is going to do this work. And so we have to take responsibility for the fact that our own lives, our unique lives, that all of what we bring to bear in our experiences, it's, you know, it's almost, I don't want to use the word incumbent because I got baggage about that word, including from my Muslim upbringing, <laughs> but it is almost incumbent on us to take on that work, you know? Um, and so those plays that you must write, you know, they're waiting for you to write them. And there's audiences out there right now, there are people waiting to see them and people waiting to act in them and uh, when people waiting to direct them. And so I'm- Inshallah, Inshallah. <laughs> Yeah, which as we all know means yes, no, maybe, <laughs> when pigs fly. <laughs> yeah, inshallah, but it also means yes, it means it also means what it means. So um, I, I'm, I'm so grateful to you. All right, let's continue on our, our exciting journey down this road. It's kind of amazing. What's next? What could be better than what we heard? I mean, you know what I mean? We're going to hear from Sheba Kareem next. She's the author of Skunk Girl, That Thing We Call a Heart, Mariam Sharma Hits the Road, and The Marvelous Mirza Girls. <laughs> Super excited to hear from her. Um, she's coming into us from Nashville, Tennessee, where she is currently a writer in residence at Vanderbilt. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, I've had this anthology on my nightstand for the past few weeks, and I've been reading one piece every night before bed, and it's been such a wonderful way to end the day. So thank you, everyone, for, for your beautiful words. Uh, I'm going to read a page from my short story, The Lives of Pious Women. Um, and in it, the protagonist is 12, and she's visiting Karachi, visiting relatives in Karachi. On the third day of Manikala's visit, I discovered the book. She'd unlocked one of the Amiras. It was crammed with her old clothes, and she spread them all across the room to see if there were any outfits she should bring to Dubai, where she was also considering opening a fashion boutique. Do you think this suits me? She said, holding up a bright yellow and silver kameez. Everything suits you, I said, and she rewarded me with a hug and kiss on the head. She was wearing the exclamation cologne I'd given her. As she sorted through her outfits, I noticed a dark green hardcover, the binding barely creased, on the shelf in the open Elmira. It seemed too thick to be a Quran, and when Munikala went to the bathroom, I took it out. It was called Bahishti Zaber, or Heavenly Ornaments in English. It was written by Mulana Ashraf, Ali, Mulana Ashraf Ali Thandi and was referred to on the cover as a classic manual of Islamic sacred law. I opened to a page that said, when the glands of the penis enters the vagina and is no longer visible, bathing becomes obligatory. I'd never seen a penis, let alone held hands with a boy. The closest I'd come had been an anonymous card snuck into my locker on Valentine's Day. You are too cute, someone had written inside. I taped the card to the inside of my locker and opened the door wide so others could see it. But the author never made himself known. And on the last day of school, I ripped it up and threw it away. I moved the book into my own Elmira 
and Munichala didn't notice its absence when she put back all her clothes, having declared none to be suitable for her new life. When she went for her afternoon nap in Nani's room, I returned to heavenly ornaments. Nearly 1,000 pages long, it was a detailed, complete guide on how to live a good and pious life. Its topics included how to pray and how to fast, how to buy and how to borrow, how to raise children and how to reform one's heart. One chapter was titled The Lives of Pious Women with small biographical notes of 100 women and the lessons that could be learned, that could be gleaned from their lives. Lesson, oh women, abandon your lust and desire for this world. Put your deen in order instead. Some of the book felt all too familiar, some like another world. Flipping through, I learned it was a major sin to wear short skirts and to treat illness with lion's milk. But what I was most eager for were the dirty parts. My mother had told me to stay away from boys because what they took, I could never get back. And now I read that if a man has intercourse with an underaged woman, bathing is not obligatory on the condition that semen does not come out and that the woman is so young that one fears her private parts will become connected. The footnote to this explained that underage girls had front and back parts so close together, it would be difficult to differentiate the two. I now understood why my mother wanted me to stay away from boys, because they could have anal intercourse with me through my vagina, and hence, it would be shame from both directions. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much for that reading. Um, we're going to keep going. Our next reader is Silai Karsai. And Silai is a, a poet and community organizer and a chocolate enthusiast, very important, <laughs> uh, from New York City. She earned her MFA in creative writing from the University of Oregon and a master's degree in women, gender, and sexuality studies and religion from Harvard University. Uh, so welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for including my work in this amazing anthology. And like others have said, um, I am so grateful for this work. I wish I'd had it uh, when I was starting out writing as well. Uh, so I'd like to read one poem from the anthology, uh, The Night Journey, and another poem uh, that was published in a, a different magazine, a journal. Um, this is the night, The Night Journey. In Sunday school, when I first read lessons of the mirage, the prophet's night ascension and travels through the seven heavens, I needed a sound concrete confirmation. On the mirage, the prophet's night ascension, there are only a few accurate sound accounts. And while I still needed concrete confirmation, I clasped at closed doors, ready to renounce. Yet I found those accurate those few accurate sound accounts, illuminated paintings of angels with golden vessels. And I flung open closed doors, ready to denounce all who threatened to sell my thoughts to devils. Within these paintings of angels with golden vessels, the prophet and Barak glide. Her silver wings soar over those who risked on faith, becoming weapons, in the hands of a cloudy day or becoming lost to folklore. The next poem um, I'd like to read is called Customs. This was published in 2018 in Newtown Literary Journal, which is a flush, it's a Queens, New York based journal. And um, I've been thinking about this work and other works um, that address um, a sense of rootedness or uprootedness, especially um, in light of the US government's withdrawal from Afghanistan since August uh, 15, um, or rather um, since the Taliban took over in August. This is customs. The customs agent asks, do you have anything to declare? Tufts of dried mulberries tumble from your tongue to the tile. The customs agent asks, what is your occupation? Crushed lapis lazuli stones spill like tears from your eyelids. The custom agent asks, where will you be staying? A minefield blooms beneath your feet. The customs agent asks, 
How long do you intend to stay? Your palms blossom pomegranate flowers. Your fingertips sprout wheat. The customs agent asks, what is the purpose of your trip? A handful of seeds flies from your ears. Thank you. Thank you so much for the beautiful poetry. And so glad to have you in the anthology. Um, our next reader is Sabah Karmati. She's a Chinese Iranian writer from the San Francisco Bay Area. And she holds degrees in English literature and creative writing from the University of Michigan and UC Davis. I almost made a request of a poem that I really want you to read tonight, but I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do. We'll just see if you read it or not. If you don't, then I might request an encore of, of you reading this. <laughs> we'll see. I want to know what it is. I mean, it's Namaz, <laughs> Can I know? I was going to ask you if you were going to read Namaz. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to read it. <laughs> um, I'm going to read two poems. Um, the first one being Namaz, um, which is in this really, really gorgeous anthology. Thank you so much to Cosm for including my poems in this and making room for, for all of our stripes. Um, it's really, really special. So I'll start with that one. Namaz. My grandmother used to remove her teeth and place them in a jar on my nightstand. It was strange to see them float. Stranger still to see the way her lips would curl into her mouth. She would come to California often, but she would rarely leave the house large hips too fragile to carry her up and down the stairs. She was a hunched woman and she slept on the floor. Sometimes she would crawl to the kitchen, but with brittle bones and shaking knees, five times a day, she would stand. She would stand, raise her hands to her ears and pray. Green pearls in her hands and Allah on her lips, what she lived for. I never thought to ask what she prayed for. It was difficult for me to speak to a woman with no teeth and a different tongue. But in the time I have lived without her, I find myself thinking about five times a day, glory be to my grandmother. Uh, and the second poem I'm going to read is published in Per Happen Magazine, a queer-led magazine for their Pride issue, and it is called There's an Iranian Drag Queen on RuPaul's Drag Race. Her name in Farsi emblazoned in sequins across her fake tits. Oh, to rest my hand in between that script I know so well, to feel the soft padding of the breasts I've always wanted. I am ready to call her mother. Let the breath of the soft last syllable drift up into the depths of her wig. At dance practice, she wears a t-shirt that says daddy, but in Farsi. And the Iranian queerness of it all lifts me straight up to heaven where all my gay ancestors are waiting for me in rose water baths. They anoint me and I'm ready to take the crown. It's me and Jackie against the judges. I show her off, icon that she is. Look at her perfectly contoured face, a snatched waist, a peak, just a peak of beard underneath her makeup. Oh, to be womanly only when necessary. Oh, to be a dragonfly so thin and shimmering, flitting about a garden, slender legs, the weight of them so light, even a daisy does not waver. And there she is in high heels, beckoning through a TV screen. I am ready to put one foot directly in front of the other, stomp down the runway. When I reach the end, I will jump, certain I can fly with Jackie's glittering wings to guide me. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a great poem. <laughs> um, Jackie Cox would be proud. <laughs> All right, we're gonna hear from Nazish Yar Khan, who is a writer based in Chicago, Illinois. Um, and she has contributed to over 50 media outlets internationally, including Chicago Tribune, NPR, Public Radio International, and more. 
Uh, she loves good food and Bollywood movies. Who doesn't? <laughs> Thank you so much for having my work in the anthology. I'm really looking forward to um, making more short stories. I typically do personal essays and commentaries and a lot of nonfiction. Um, so I'll start reading and this is Lost in Translation between Delhi and Chicago. The city at their feet, Safia rocked a Kaliki Zoha, humming a childhood lullaby. Far down below, a snowplow and a spool of CTA buses inched towards shiny, hopeful Navy Pier. In neighboring skyscrapers, red, green, and gold lights flickered and Christmas trees glistened. Safia's heart hurt at their promise of family, togetherness, love, memories in the making to be summoned to deliver hope or mend disappointments for years to come. If I gave you my heart today, would you still not want it? The question flitted through Safia's mind. She gazed at the snow that lit up the night sky, even as it entombed the city. Such beauty, but cold and unforgiving. As if sensing Safia's thoughts, Zoha grew quiet and clenched little fingers around the delicate gold chain at her mother's neck. It'll break, sweetheart. She, un she gently uncurled Zoha's fist eyes heavy from a sleepless night. It felt as though all Safia had to do was reach out and her fingertips would touch Lake Michigan, a dream now icy and cracked in so many places. Cracked like the cocoon of familiarity woven by her parents, siblings, cousins, aunts, uncles. India was home, yet marriage and new beginnings in America had been a suitable trade, even training up. Yet nothing had prepared Safia for what she'd slip on with that half carat wedding ring. Gone was the familiarity of family and beloved neighbors, whether it was asking for a cup of sugar, sharing news of a child's birth, attending family weddings. She instead found herself sandwiched between increasingly vibrant memories and equally elusive feelings of connection. And there was Rafi. Self-assured, self-sufficient, a man incredibly comfortable in his own skin. Safia sighed, her breath leaving smudges in the cold, clear glass window. If I give you my heart today, would you still not want it? The question grazing at Safia's consciousness had to be nudged aside as Zoha began to fidget, rooting, hungry again. Safia nestled into the second-hand couch. Lifting her feet out of the coffee table, she undid her blouse and eased the newborn into the crook of her arm. Soon, Zoha's tiny fingers rested against soft flesh. From Delhi, one of India's biggest cities, Safia had been surprised by Chicago's awe-inspiring, hadn't been surprised by Chicago's awe-inspiring skyline, the pace, its ethnic mix. Before the baby, it had been all about studying for her USMLE to qualify for a medical residency, volunteering at an inner city clinic, a weekend routine of dinner with Rafi's family and friends, a full calendar. It made life interesting. Also, she slowly realized it was her shield against the gnawing emptiness that came when most conversations invariably stopped short of becoming a window into another's hearts, hope, aspirations, and feelings. Neighborly friendliness stopped with a hi and a hello in the elevator, in the hallway, and never made it past her threshold or theirs. And it wasn't for lack of trying. A passion for food had meant gifts of big baked cookies, samosas, chocolate park. Both countries had the same 24 hours, the same demanding days. So what made people back home so open to nurturing relationships, even dropping in past 9.30 p.m. on a weeknight to say hello? Why were new friendships so much easier to kindle there? Thank you. Thank you um, so much for the reading. I'm so glad to have you with us. Thank our you so much. And I <laughs> our next reader, the second of our triple threat of Khans is Shamima Khan, <laughs> the wrath of Khan. Uh, Shamima Khan is the recipient of the City of Ottawa Youth Poetry Award and was a finalist for the CBC Poetry Contest 
and she's most recently been published in the anthology Muslim American Writers at Home. Uh, she uh, uh, is currently at work on a chapbook of creative nonfiction, and we're looking forward to hearing from her. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm coming to you from unceded Algonquin uh, Anishinaabe territory, known to some as Ottawa, the capital of Canada. Uh, I'm super grateful my last name started with a K, Khan, because um, I got to get ready while listening to some of you. Um, so I knew I wouldn't be the first one on. Um, but then I didn't realize I turned on the video. So some of you might have seen me <laughs> moving around. Um, the joys of, uh, you know, switching from MS Teams and Zoom and all of that. Um, this anthology is so important to me and I'm so blessed because it's the third Muslim uh, writing and art anthology that I've been lucky enough to have my work published in this year, uh, 2021. Um, and uh, all of them are so important because they're offering, you know, an innovative and unfortunately for me, I think, um, a still an all too rare point of view. Um, diversity is a fact, we all know that, but inclusion, it's a choice. Um, and I think that uh, the older I get, the more I realize that just how important representation is, how much you know it matters. Um, when you hear the phrase North American writer, um, who do you picture when you hear that? Is it accurate? Uh, you know, what would aliens from another planet think if they looked only at North American art and media? Would they truly understand who makes up North American society? Anyway, uh, I'm so excited to connect with um, all the other writers on this project in particular. Um, I think sometimes creating art and writing is isolating and community matters more than words can express. I was going to read my whole piece out, but instead I'm just gonna read a few paragraphs and actually some of the earlier writers really inspired me. So I'm gonna be brave and read out something different and new uh, first and then, uh, and then go on to a couple of paragraphs from the piece that's in the book. This one is called Episodes of Me and You. I remember one particular October sunset from last year. We watched the petals of fire spread through the sky as we made kisses in a tiny alcove behind the Woodruff Forest. The wind was small enough to trail its fingers through our clothing and swish about leaves the color of lemons. It was one of those evenings where I could smell the snowflakes about to arrive a day or two in advance. Last year, autumn was cool and refreshing enough for you to blink open your just waking self put on the first t-shirt that touched your hand and walk out into the honey light of morning. But I remember wishing it was colder that night. I wanted it to be cold, cold enough for me to freeze it. The bluish tinge to the air, the slight release of the pines, elms and birches, the way his face crinkled if I secretly opened my eyes while we kissed. I wanted to freeze it, to save it, the way a snow globe saves the miniature house, the tree, the confetti, and the base of the world. I wanted to freeze that moment and keep it so I could pull it out easy from the top shelf on the top of my closet, just after my voice gave out from screaming matches months later. I wanted to turn it upside down or hold it to the bare bulb in our small bedroom when he left me to go walking by himself all night. I wanted to be able to push my face against the slice of moon from that evening whenever I needed to, whenever our relationship disintegrated into the pile of unpaid bills onto the desk we brought back from the curb, or all the time we forgot to caress I love yous into each other's skin before rushing to work. This need to hoard the small pearl moments of our relationship, the early ecstatic picnics in the rain, the drinking hot chocolate from each other's mouths, the bouquet of tangerines he gave me that first time. This deed was so urgent right from the beginning, it was as if I always knew somehow how it would end. Thank you. 
I'm an old pro at this now. So I know to bookmark my place with the uh, price tag from the sweatpants I bought yesterday. All right. This is from the book, first paragraph, fall. You can see a theme here. I can feel the remnants of that old pain brushing my throat, pain. Oh, I'm tired of this, of feeling pain and not your arms, your loose, lovely hugs. Where are you now? I want to be able to forgive you for not being here, for driving me to seek solace in useless things like the curling orange leaves I walk through to the library or the whiteness of the sky. And sometimes I can. Sometimes I do find peace in them, but not today. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you so much for that reading. Um, we're now going to hear from Uzma Aslam Khan, uh, who is an award-winning author of five no uh, novels, uh, including Trespassing, which was nominated for a 2003 Commonwealth Prize. And her new novel, the, the newest novel, uh, which is uh, The Miraculous True History of Nomi Ali, uh, which is uh, out already in India and Pakistan and Sweden, and will be coming out in the United States uh, and the UK in the spring. So we're looking forward to that. Welcome, Uzma. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kazim, and all of you. I'm just really happy to be reading in community with you. Um, it's, it's just such a sweet and safe space, so thank you. Um, I'm primarily a fiction writer and primarily a novelist, so the piece that I wrote for the anthology is actually quite unusual for me. It's a work of nonfiction and it's rather short. Um, so I'm going to be reading from that. It is called Stealth Christian, Stealth Muslim. My first time in a cathedral was also my first taste of alcohol. Rose had brought to our convent school in Karachi, Pakistan, a small bottle of vodka. As a Christian, she had legal access to it. As a Muslim, I did not. We were 15. With prefect gowns as screens, we tipped the vodka into 7-Up and jumped the school wall into the courtyard of St. Patrick's Cathedral. It was 1984 a war in Afghanistan, General Zia's dictatorship at home, the seven up bottle green as our flag. I understood the risks. My father was a religious man whose own father had prohibited all forms of intoxication, even tea. Till he got married, my father's most audacious beverage was milk. While caffeine was not forbidden me, ditching classes and jumping walls were radical trespasses, even without the drink. I also understood the irony. St. Patrick's Cathedral is the seat of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Karachi, constructed on the site of a chapel made for the Irish troops who conquered these lands. Only in Pakistan could a respite from one chain of command be another. What I did not understand yet was fear. I remember the creak of the door and the small congregation inside no one looked twice at the two girls in convent uniforms taking seats in the back. We passed the bottle between us, the paper straw kissing our lips, the seven up warm. The stained glass seemed familiar, not because I had seen it before, but because I grew up reading about such things in books. Besides, by the school canteen where I lined up for lunch each day stood a life-size statue of Jesus and Mary. Christian iconography was as much a part of my daily landscape as the canteen or General Zia's sermons against non-Muslims, women, and the countries that kept him in power. Most of all, I remember the feel of my surroundings, restful and spacious. After that day, whenever Rose and I escaped the convent for the cathedral, the feeling was there. This was and still is my deepest impression of what it means to be in a sanctuary a sanctuary from war, dictators, families, and the school syllabi that bored us, for it came from Cambridge University in England instead of the environment that we embodied. A sanctuary too from having to explain ourselves to each other. We both knew the profiling to which Pakistani Christians were subjected as unpatriotic outsiders, sympathetic to British colonial oppressors, 
and the complex history is being erased through this distorted lens. Karachi's Christian community is Goan Catholic, tracing its lineage not to British, but Portuguese India established in the 1500s. Rose's family had settled in Pakistan before the Second World War. Mine had arrived later as refugees of the 1947 Indian partition. Yet, we never concerned ourselves with questions of national identity. Outside our sanctuary, othering for other reasons was more intimately felt. Our bodies mark the boundary between Eastern Muslim, pure or sexually repressed, depending on who you ask, and Western Christian, free or sexually promiscuous, depending. What we did not know then is that these binaries were growing more pronounced at precisely the historical moment when we sought each other's company in a cathedral. While Rose and I shared bottles of vodka and 7-Up, General Zia altered Pakistan's British era blasphemy laws to include a death sentence for anyone perceived to offend Islam. When he introduced the Hadood ordinance that deemed adultery and fornication criminal offenses, Rose and I shared tales of love. So we both went in stealth each time we jumped the wall. The proof is that I still hesitate to share the story of my first drink or disclose Rose's real name. The proof is that while I was not afraid, not afraid in 1984, now I have learned fear. Recently, I shared this story with a white American colleague. Her response, Muslim girls do that, immediately landed me in a state of shut upness. As I struggled to locate the assumptions implicit in her disbelief, it got worse. I must not be a real Muslim, she kept on. I didn't even look like one. And where did I learn to be free spirited? Is it because I live in the United States? These were not questions. They were opinions gesturing for validation. So I did not say that my convent schooling was before I set foot on this continent, that if I am free, I have my chaotic, complicated upbringing to credit. Nor that in the 20 years I have lived here on and off, I have experienced little change in how my intersectional identities are met with. My colleague's configuration of the East was familiar to me even before I began hearing it in the US. I had read it in the British books taught at my convent. It was familiar too for being eerily in reverse to the dichotomy championed by General Zia. For her, it was oppressive Islam, for him, oppressive West. Both fixed identities in opposition to each other, denying the possibility for coexistence. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, little excerpt flavor of the full piece, which I hope everyone will check out in the anthology. Um, the next reader is Tara Meselik McMahon, and she is the author of Barefoot Up the Mountain, which is the winner of the 2020 Open Country Press Chapbook Contest. And her poems have appeared in various um, journals, including River Sticks, Cold Mountain Review, uh, and Duende. And she has also co-authored a children's chapter book called The Closet of Dreams, which is forthcoming. So glad to have you here with us. Thank you so much, Kazem. Um, I'm so honored to be part of this anthology. It's, it's such a thrill and um, it's just a gorgeous collection. Um, I just wanna say for one moment, and thank you, um, Red Hen Press, you've all been amazing. Um, Kasim, your introduction to this anthology was so moving and inspirational to me. Um, it's life-changing to me actually, so thank you. I just really wanted to take a moment to say that the, the acceptance and, and the love, the tolerance, um, you know, loving all our stripes, I think, as Saba said. Anyhow, I'll go on to a poem uh, that, um, that I'd like to read. Uh, this poem um, was written um, in Torres del Paine, actually, under their enormous orbs, their stars, and um, anyhow. A pilgrimage to the hives of withered bees is what the gods of perfect sugar make, and she follows, scales a green mountain to Mexico, to the shrine of no roof, no walls, where white butterflies trace infinity loops and the stations of the cross with their tissue paper marigolds 
and scrolled save me notes, always messed with her shadow, dealing rummy or stud poker, perhaps a progression of macaws. Buenos dias, buenos dias. One goes up, another comes down, and she wonders, will she ever touch a man the way the gods of perfect sugar make the morning's peach or persimmon, even peach persimmon. Buenos tardes, buenos tardes. In rain, and again, she a lonely firefly in August when she meets a brown boy inside her yellow head and he speaks hyacinth, speaks blue juniper. He even contests her poetry, contests her Saturdays, her Saturday Snoopy pants she wears all week long, except on Saturday. Funny how the mind fills, fills the mouth, how the filled mouth stretches for watermelon, for rain, how rain fills the calla lily, fills the belly button, sunbathing in August, akin to vodka and a votive in Vienna, where her grandmother was born before the war, before the war, before refuge to Mexico, though no tequila to tie the travel, vodka and a votive. Now repetition, just another word for tortilla chip, another word for train trip. Her first five years, she goes to live with her grandmother. She goes to live with her grandmother because her own mother couldn't cope. Her own mother couldn't cope with a second child, couldn't cope with a child born, not a boy, a girl who one day might bumble, even crumble, or then again ride the interminable train, all the places you'd never hope to see, except, sadly, she does, a thousand times just sitting there, movement, movement, without movement, without action. Though sometime her heart thrusts, thrusts a rush, and she clambers back to grandmother's home, grandmother's home, where the gods perfect sugar take their sabbaths where her brother visits on roast chicken sundays and always wins the pandulce eating contest but does he cheat the gods and she wonder she wonders if her brother will return her thoughts clearing as after infection after rain yet her words all fish and pine tar and she fumbles on bumbles here, here on the scales of the scales of a green mountain to Mexico on God's 57th floor. Some when between 56 and after she stops yearning or is it some why between 58 and how she continues to yearn. But isn't there supposed to be a pause, an ending some dark opaque wisdom fashioned to save her, save his contas, save even a green mountain. Buenos noches, buenos noches. Just one swift fetch of a single flare and she'll open her knapsack to stars. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that beautiful reading and, and thank you for your uh, comment as well. Um, so we're gonna hear now from Mandy Facenden Brower. She's an American uh, child psychologist who spent time in Northern Pakistan discovering Islam there. Uh, and uh, she went from there, she says that trip changed her life she went from there to Gaza and afterwards to Egypt, uh, where she taught at the American University of Cairo and at the Cairo University Medical School. Uh, so uh, she's, she's published many books for children in Arabic and English. Uh, and we are very glad to have her with us today. Mandy, take it away. Thank you. It's a privilege to be in this anthology, and I urge everybody to read it and enjoy it. It's very varied. It's marvelous. Anyway, having lived in Gaza during the first Intifada, 
these are my reflections. By all accounts, things have not changed very much. Instead of enemies, the enemy having boots on the ground, now they bomb from the air. This is what I wrote. Religion was ever present and very popular in very important in Palestine. People would refer to the Quran for almost anything and Islamic and Christian provisions principles prevailed, especially as they concerned helping one another. Even with very meager supplies, everyone helped everyone. Uh, what I was presented in Gaza was an Islam that was kind, caring, and responsive to ordinary as well as extraordinary uh, situations. The main, what I also learned as I did in Pakistan was the main uh, jihad was fighting one's own demons. The other jihad was fighting for the rights that are guaranteed under many international UN and non-UN conventions. And Palestinians are well aware they don't have them and they want them. And one man on a more recent trip to Palestine told me, all we have now is Allah. No one else seems to care about our plight. Always when I was in Gaza, there was fighting and we would hear the, it was like being in an arcade, but sometimes the sounds were further away and sometimes they were close. We would be drinking tea with friends and all of a sudden we would hear the shouts and we would hear the shooting. And if things were bad, my husband would leave and I'd be left sitting drinking tea with people. And it seemed really unreal. And how could I just sit and drink tea when people were getting killed? But what else could I do? I had so many stories in Gaza that are still very prevalent in my mind. I see the little girl, the three-year-old who was run over by an Israeli Jeep, crushing her tooth. Or the toddler, the, the infant that was in her mother's arms and the soldiers couldn't find her teenage brother to shoot or to take away. So they just put the gum. into the brain is not helpful. Uh, I can't wonder what happened to these children and to so many others. Killing was everywhere and all the time. All the funerals were, it was forbidden to assemble. People would of course get together for funerals and the Grizzlies would choose that time to circle the funeral house or the wake house. They would often Nothing. We'll end with a poem I wrote when I was in Gaza. It's called Funeral in Gaza. And this is just part of the poem. Death, death everywhere in Gaza as brackish tears fall into polluted water. A nation is mourning as the young join together in daring danger. Sometimes only spray blacks slogans on clay walls before being gunned down by smiling soldiers. Historical horrors around their necks. Medal of honor, those stars of sacred myth, more than skin deep and proudly passed on as if sadness worn inside is a gift of love, not painful pathology while another legend is born of injustice, cruelty, obvious wrong, a new generation hurtled into hatred, scarred beyond healing, destined to look for an enemy on whom to carve redemption, remembering only death, death, and more death. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mandy, for that powerful reading. We're going to hear from Leila Nader next. 
Um, Layla is an interspecies kin maker, creative critical researcher, undisciplined storyteller, and eccentric educator. She is an assistant professor and founding director of the Environmental uh, Humanities Program at the University of Rochester. Uh, and her work has been supported by the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and the New York Council on the Arts. <laughs> Uh, so we're excited to have her here. She's currently finishing a memoir about growing up in an Afghan American Muslim Catholic family during the Cold War. And thank you so much, Layla, for being here with us. Hey, thank you everybody. And thanks to Kazim and Red Hen Press for this beautiful anthology. Uh, my piece in the anthology is something that is now part of my book that I'm wor working on finishing, which is about, um, as Kazim said, growing up in an Afghan American family and also Afghan Catholic, sort of Catholic family uh, during the Cold War. And so I'm just going to read probably the first page and a half of what's included in the anthology. And it's called Cold War. And actually, this is a story about how my parents met ultimately. And so this is sort of the introduction to uh, how they met. My parents competed for their children's love, measuring affection through our ethnic, religious, and consumer choices. Since we grew up in the States, my mother had the home advantage. What kid wouldn't choose her all-American fun over my father's foreign moral policing? When her favorite top 40 songs crackled through our car's radio, she turned up the volume and she, my brother, my two sisters and I sang shouted together, our blue Volkswagen van barreling down the country roads of our small town in New York state. She filled the house with the smell of chocolate chip cookies baking in the oven, pulled out her credit card for trendy outfits and ice cream sundaes at the mall and snuck me into the hair salon when my father forbade me to cut my long hair. Just put it in a ponytail, she said, and handed me an elastic scrunchie when the new perm curled my hair to my ears. He'll never noticed. He did. Baba made rules and my mother taught me how to break them. She was the normal one, I thought, just like everyone, every American in the USA. During high school football games, she, she had twirled a baton in the front of her high school marching band, killing, uh, sorry, kicking her legs high into the air in a mini skirt and tasseled boots. So I did my hair the way she wanted, moosed, teased, hairsprayed, and frizzy on top so I could be normal too, like her, like everyone else. Baba was different, and not only was he hell-bent on accentuating his difference, he called it Afghan pride, he wanted his children to be different too, just like him. When my aunt sent new Perhan Tamben from Afghanistan, for some reason, they always chose the most conspicuous hues, bright red, shiny yellow, lime green. He suggested I celebrate his sister's gifts by wearing them to the mosque, which was fine, I could do that, but he didn't stop there. Why wouldn't I wear these flashy baggy outfits everywhere to the grocery store, to the post office? And the thought terrified me. Why not to school to show my friends I was a proud Afghan girl? My hometown in the 1980s was a town with limited global imagination. My classmates made sense of my coloring by guessing that my family had come from Italy the darkest, most faraway place these rural white kids could fathom. And I didn't correct them. When I resisted Baba's idea of interrupting my high school's parade of stonewashed blue jeans, white t-shirts, and Adidas sneakers with an Afghan fashion show of radiant pink, he turned away wounded as if I'd personally insulted him. My mother gladly would have let me and my sub siblings plant our butts down in front of the TV all day or chug cans of soda to quench our thirst. But Baba found these behaviors morally dubious. The icy Coca-Cola fizzing in our, in our glasses at dinner, he announced one day was actually chemical water and no longer allowed in the house. Family ties and the Cosby show, family safe programs by most standards were deemed proponents of a licentious American culture when the child characters grew up and began to date. 
Our time, he declared, was better spent practicing Persian writing skills, and he instituted after-dinner lessons. I drafted letters to my aunts and cousins in Kabul, whom I'd never met. I translated newspaper articles or paragraphs from novels, which he painstakingly marked up with red pen. More homework upon regular school homework, plus every morning, 30 minutes of reading the Quran and prayers. Baba exerted concentrated effort to impress an Afghan Muslim identity upon his children to counteract the American culture that we naturally absorbed every day, the culture my mother reinforced just by being there. Thanks. Thank you so much for that excerpt. And once again, I encourage everyone to get the anthology so they can hear the whole piece and to find, follow Leila's book as well when it comes out. Um, our next reader is, I'm glad she's joining us, <laughs> is Samina Najmi, <coughs> uh, who I'm glad to have in my community as well and met her <coughs> recently and, and really happy to, to know her. Uh, she teaches multi-ethnic US literature at uh, Cal State University, Fresno. And her creative nonfiction has appeared in World Literature Today, the Massachusetts Review, the Rumpus, and other journals. She grew up in Pakistan and England. Uh, and uh, I'm so glad you made it, Samina. Take it away. Thank you, Gazim. Um, it's been said before, but it bears repeating. Um, this, uh, I mean, thank you for the, the labor of love of putting this. Um, Collection together, um, much needed, um, and it um, and you know curating um, it's really kind of a selfless act. So thank you for that. Thank you, Red Hen Press, um, and I am I'm also glad that, that I made it today. Um, I I am a little envious of um, people who already have their cop the copies of of, of um, New Moons. Um, I've been displaced by fire, and so. Um, I'm hoping that my 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 uh, copy will find its way to this now my third place third home um, in in the last six weeks. But um, I I share that by way of saying to that um, what I'm going to read actually is a work in progress, kind of responding to this moment, um, and um, it's titled Ash Tree Song. Calamity is a fire that obliterates everything but itself, explodes you out of accustomed ways of being, your accustomed ways of seeing. Home will be home again someday, but how to go back when I go back? To the cocoon of a condo on Kalamurna Ave, named for the valley fig with roots in ancient Smyrna, Transplanted to Fresno, open voweled Spanish for this land of ash trees. A calamar in a condo my children loved, a space for just them and me. Restoration companies bid for the assignment. They talk of structural damage and loss of use. Personal property divided between the salvageable and unsalvageable. They'll rebuild the drywall and replace the very frame of the roof. Trust in technology to abate the asbestos, ozone the smoke odor out of all that can be saved. Even my long traveled, long awaited couch and carpet, off white in color, because why not now that the kids are grown up and gone? Those belongings will be good as new, they say, someday. I'm grateful, I believe. But who will restore the cindered self, compile an inventory of the ways I used to be? Insurance companies speak of policy limits. I never gave thought to limits on anything. It was quite the conflagration covered by local news. Fire trucks lining the street, 
like a long metallic red hot ribbon. Come gather and gawk, behold the blaze, the sublime of the spectacle, the spark of the story, and in its wake, a heart. Charred its capacity, lavished with abandon, a self-indulgence as though at some all you can give buffet. No thought of depletion, the finiteness of things. Finally, a reckoning, a baptism of fire. My world, a blistering cliche. With apocalypse comes revelation. The busy, the awkward, the indifferent, the scorching scarcity of grace. Let me know if you need anything when calamity strikes. When fire burns a hole through the life you knew, what you need is warmth. There's no explaining irony to the oblivious. From my ashen attic, no phoenix rises. Just a bleak light dawning through the haze. Now in my one little flame of life, an eternity to re-see of learning to re-be. And the sadness settles in like smoke, opaque and thick and cloying. Thank you. Thank you, Samina, and thank you for being with me. Um, you send me your address and we'll make sure we get a copy of this book to you. Or I have a couple of extras, come down to San Diego and uh, pick one up. That's, I'm, I'm broadcasting from my bedroom, uh, my uh, guest room right now. So when you, when you come and visit, that's where you'll stay, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Gazem. Thank yeah. you. Um, wow, it's a, what an amazing array of work we've been hearing tonight. We're gonna continue with Anissa Rahim, who is a writer and a public interest lawyer. Her poetry has appeared widely, um, but in Blaise Vox, near and dear to my heart, of course, the publisher of my first book. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, the Tiny Seed Literary Journal, uh, Common Ground Review, and many other places. Um, her hybrid memoir, American Neo, A History of Remembering and Forgetting, was long listed for the 2019 Pank Book Contest. Um, and she has an MFA in creative writing from Rutgers, Newark. So, Welcome, Anissa. I'm looking forward to hearing your work. Um, thank you. I have just had just goosebumps since I've seen most this book. And um, like others have said, just reading in bits and pieces people's work has just been amazing. Um, so I'm just, I'm gonna read the two poems that are, that are in the um, anthology. A Russian hacked my Pinterest account, containing images of waterfalls and fashion pinups I know this because Pinterest sent me an email that I had logged in from Moscow. And later that week, the IRS called me from an Indian call center. And when I told the man over the phone as I sipped my tea that I did not believe he was from the IRS and that I did not owe him money, he said he would take me to municipal court, throw me in jail. I said he should be ashamed of himself, an Indian defrauding another Indian, imagining him and a dozen others huddled together in the basement of Palika Bazaar making these calls where I once bought pirated CDs. I told him I would report him to the FBI and in this way, borders permeate, the water seep into computers and cell phones. I have been border crossing all my life, not the kind of breaking that is illegal, but still a crossing, trying now to be still and stationary, domesticated. Think of these lone figures, specks or dots on a map, on their tablets and computers, trying to be like comets or shooting stars or rather small snipers from the solace of a distant millennium. Um, and the second poem is, is Hot Carpets, which um, I'm still a little bit in disbelief that it's in print. <laughs> so I am on the living room floor and my brothers and I are playing Dungeons and Dragons, slaying as we dart from the couch to the table. And I'm next to a Christmas tree in a red dress. Or was it white with frills? Were we unwrapping Christmas presents or were we cutting yellow birthday cake? Or was it ice cream cake 
And did I have chicken pox and have to stay home all day? Did I play the piano? Did my brother wander in the living room to tell me to play Stevie Wonder's I Just Called to Say I Love You? Or The Entertainer, a Broadway hit, but in easy form? Or did I choose Beethoven's German dance because it won a competition? Was I that girl winning contests, wanting to hide in corners? Was I that girl wanting to disappear as soon as I became visible? Then did I fall into the ocean, fall too off a jet ski, and gaze at fresh cut green grass from the blue of the ocean? Now I am eating snow, a Chicago snow, like the kind where us roommates stayed inside for two days because there was a blizzard. And once the ice went still, I wore red bell bottoms and we ate burgers seated on red stools at Johnny Rockets. You sabotage yourself, my friend said, just as you get closer to the thing you want, as if you can't just want it or have it or eat it or know it. We are in Chicago's Hyde Park and walking from the Shoreland dorm to the lake, but a lake is not the sea, an endless rippling, and I am not sure what is dream or what is desertion. I am in the desert and I wonder about the lake, the sea, the waterfall, the stream, the river, the water, the water. In a dream, a man chases me and I try to run and I don't know if I escape, but I think I do. I think I know what it is to be inside Hot Carpets. Thank you so much for that beautiful reading. I really want to say there, you know, there are people who, when I was editing this anthology, people whose work that I knew, and then there were those surprises where I had not been familiar with a person's work and I read it for only for the first time. And uh, Anissa, your work is, is, was some of that work. I hadn't read it before and I just found it so beautiful. Um, and I'm so happy to know your work now. Um, so thank you. Uh, we, have, uh, we have three more readers. Uh, and then, I have, then I'm going to close it up uh, with a brief reading just to let you know wh where we're at in the evening. Um, so our, uh, our next reader is Marina Reza. She calls herself a recovering New Yorker. <laughs> she was born in Dhaka and she's now in Berlin, Germany. And her work has been published in Sand Journal, uh, Newtown Literary Journal, Bone Bouquet, and other places. So glad to have your work in the anthology, Marina, and looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much, Kazem, Red Hen Press, uh, all the contributors and all of our friends who are also joining. Um, yeah, I'm in Berlin. It's almost 2 a.m. here, but it's so worth it to be here. And thankfully, I'm also a night owl, <laughs> um, so it works out. Um, yeah, so I'm going to read a few excerpts from an essay called Lashes, and uh, it begins with an epigraph from the Quran. The woman who commits Zina and the man who commits Zina, lash each of them 100 lashes. Do not let pity deter you in a matter ordered by God, if you believe in God and the last day. And this essay is just broken up into sections with their own little titles. Um, Ryan. Ryan interviewed me about sex and boys, Mimi, Mimi and Islam, me and Islam, and I told him everything in that interview and we slept together and then it's quite possible I told him too much. Woodside, New York. My tutor was in the seventh grade when I was in the third. She was named Niti and she would talk about periods. And she said sex was the moment the tip of the man's penis touched the tip of the woman's nipple. I believed it. Nothing had told me otherwise anyway. I didn't learn what sex was until I opened up the Oxford Dictionary at 10 years old, sitting under the mosquito net over my bed one afternoon in Taka. Merriam-Webster was never as explicit. The movies. I also don't have the... Book, so I, have, I just printed it out. Um, each time my parents went out and my sister was not home, I turned to a cable network and flipped through channels to find a sex scene or a kiss at the least and looked forward to the chance to see it alone to make up for the massive censorship of my childhood. For a few years, the search always meant fast forwarding through Bollywood's 1942 love story on a video cassette. In Dhaka, it was Sonique's music video for It Feels So Good on MTV. Looking for sex, 
or a love scene. But how can you rub against the furniture when written prayers and images of mosques are all around the house? Zeno. Halal and haram can also refer to the sort of activities one engages in. Zina, extramarital or premarital sex. My sister and I found Pakistani porn on my father's laptop. Where have Papa's hands been? I don't think about his hands years later at college where I'm too busy numbing out every weekend and pretty soon every other day. Walking home at 2 a.m. from the library, feeling intensely alone. This is it, college? Before it ever happened, I remember thinking, this is it, sex? And how reductive the baseball metaphors inching up to it. When it was announced that our PE class would be baseball or softball that quarter, my stomach sank. Blood. Mimi and Papa pray five times a day, but I could only move through the motions. When I'm bloody, I'm told to stay away from the prayer rug. I'm considered impure, haram. When skin breaks during a fast, the fast is broken too. Baudelaire told me to stay drunk, so I did. All we know is reenactment. Hold. Does anything ever, does anything ever, does anything ever leave the body? When I was seven, Gayum Lee stepped down from a chair onto a parakeet we had taken out of its cage. We watched a flattened body and scattered plumage, a leaky beak. We were babes, young and sensitive. How moments run in you long after they've run out. How every sexual encounter leaves a deposit. The plumbing is old and sensitive. Please flush gently and hold. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marina, for that beautiful reading. Um, our next reader is Fatima Van Hadam. She's not only the only Van Hadam in this anthology, my friends, <laughs> there may be four Khans in the anthology, but there are two Van Hadams. So that's kind of amazing. And I want to tell you, there were just so many submissions that came in for this anthology, you know, mashallah. And so I was going through them and choosing them over a long period of time. And it wasn't until after I'd made all the choices that I went back and found out, oh, there's two people with the same last name and they're both, you know, a quote unquote non-Muslim name, right? Not typically Muslim name. And they're both from New Mexico. So what are the odds? Uh, so anyhow, we're really glad to have you with here. Uh, we have you with us, Fatima. Uh, Fatima Van Hattam is from New Mexico. Um, she eats most things with chili and she has a large and wonderful family. She's a PhD student in language literacy and sociocultural studies. Uh, currently, her work has been published in Calix, Journal, Critical Inquiry and Language Studies, uh, Open Democracy, um, uh, and, uh, and, and many other places. So welcome. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Kazem. Um, and thank you, Marina. That was, that was so beautiful. And I feel honored to read after you. Um, so I'm, I'm calling in from Santa Fe, New Mexico, which um, is Tewa land here in northern New Mexico. And it's just such an honor to be here. Um, and to your point, Kazem, I want to call my mom in because my mom is the other Van Hatem in the book. And it's so special to just to be in an anthology with my mom. And um, my mom is joining us today, but she's actually... Um, She's sick with COVID. So if you are the candle lighting, du'a making, um, invocation saying, please uh, put that out for my, my mama who is here with us in spirit and somewhere on the Zoom today. Um, but it's just such an honor to be featured together in the same book. So I'll read the pieces um, that are included. Um, so the first is titled May 11th, 2018. The tiger orchid on the bathtub ledge bloomed today. And I finished the first year of my PhD. But what use are theories of decoloniality, feminism, critical race, when everything falls apart? A concept remains a concept. 
a theory just a theory. Better to care for orchids, just so. The light, the moisture, just so. Bring things into balance. My first year PhD taught me about the online etymology dictionary, but I'd rather make up the roots of words according to my mood. For example, how silence comes from torment because it begins with a sigh and ends with a hiss. I thought if I loved hard, hard, hard. There is mold in the bathtub grout. I'm convinced we brought it all the way from London where everything eventually rots. Even the right conditions for the orchid can still just be wrong. And the next piece um, is called Rocks in Fiction. So if you've ever been to New Mexico, you know we have a lot of rocks here. So I invite you into this place with me. Rocks weigh in her sweater pockets, wool sagging misshapen. One grasshopper leg, torn askew between magazine and plastic cup. He'll die tonight, irrelevant. At the mercy of something immense like one million refugees on a Jordanian plain, a limb askew, a death tonight. Are you Muslim or something? I know it's off topic, but what's with the blue headscarf? You creator of fictions, weighed down by rocks. The thing about belonging is that it's mostly just longing. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we're gonna go send our you know, very best wishes to Mama for a quick recovery. And there is a planned event. Um, uh, Aya has dropped it into the chat. There's an, uh, a planned event uh, next week. For, uh, that both Fatima and Rabia will be featured at. So hopefully you can make it and hear her. Um, so our last reader of the evening is Faisal Mohideen. Um, is Faisal with us? Ah, there you are, okay. So glad you are joining us. He's the author of a book called Displaced Children of Displaced Children and a, and a chapbook called The Riddle of Longing. He teaches at Highland, uh, he teaches English at Highland Public, uh, Highland Park uh, High School, excuse me, in suburban Chicago. And in addition to being an incredible poet, he is a visual artist. I don't, I need you to know that he is the one who's created this beautiful cover and his artwork is very grounded in uh, drawing um, and in, uh, in calligraphy and writing an image going together. Uh, and he just does beautiful, beautiful work. So I hope you'll check out his visual work as well as the um, the poetry that he has done as well. You, this piece of art is no longer for sale. It has been bought by a person you may know. By person. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Faisal, looking forward. Well, thank you, thank you so much. I, I had to step away for about fifteen minutes, but. Um, Thank you so much, Cosm. I, I feel like our paths have been crossing and crisscrossing um, for years now. And um, the, I, I think I remember you posted on Facebook like another drawing of mine, like, does anyone know who did this? And then Rami. Our That's friend, how we found the cover. I mean, I'd known you before, but we, I didn't know that was your work. And I saw yes. it, found it somewhere and I was like, who did this beautiful thing? So, but thank you for reaching out and seeing it. And Rami, thank you for like helping Kazem find his way to me. So, and then Monica and Toby, and I know Caitlin's not here, but a lot of people were involved in the, the making of the book behind the scenes. I know there's a huge staff at Red, Red Hand. All of you did great work, Kazem. Thank you all of you who are here. Thank you so much. Um, and then to have poems in there as well. It's like a huge, uh, cool honor and delight uh, for me. And the community is really special. So. Um, I'm grateful for that. So I'm gonna read um, um, one of the poems, uh, Guzzle for the Diaspora. We have always been the displaced children of displaced children. 
tethered by distant rivers to abandoned lands, our blood's history lost. To temper the grief, imagine your father's last breath as a mogul garden, marble pool at its center, the mirrored sky holding all his tribe had lost. Above the tussle of his wounded city, sad-eyed paper kites fight to stay aloft. One lucky child will be crowned the winner. Everyone else will have lost. Wish peace upon every stranger who arrives at your door, even the thief. For you never know when your last chance at redemption will be lost. In another version of the story, a steady loneliness mothers away the rust. Yet without windows in its hull, the time traveler's supplication gets lost. Against flame-lipped testimonies of exiles' erasures, the swinging of an ax. Held bunion trees populate your nightmares, new enlightenments lost. The rim of this porcelain cup is chipped, so sip with practiced caution. Even a trace of blood will copper the flavor, the respite of tea now lost. Tell me, Fassel, with what new surrender can you evade deeper damnation? Whatever it is, hack away before your children too become the lost. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Faisal, for that beautiful reading. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight, celebrating this anthology. Um, and I want to especially thank Red Hem Press, which has put so much work and effort into making this anthology happen. Um, I did not pitch this anthology to Red Hem Press. They approached me. Um, four years ago now, and they said, we really feel this is such an important moment. We want to have Muslim, we want to help bring Muslim voices out. And will you, will you edit this anthology for us? And some people know this story. I actually said, no, I was completely overwhelmed. I was at a position point in my life where I, you know, family stuff, you know, professional thing, everything, I couldn't do it. Um, and they just pitched it. They were so committed. They were willing to put in the time and energy to make it happen. Um, Monica, Toby, and Rebecca from Red Hand, who's not on the call, I don't think. Um, they really, they were really committed to bringing this book into the world and promoting it. And like I said, there have been people like like Aya, like Barack, um, and others of you contributors also who are really trying to help, you know, promote and get the, you know, create these readings and get these voices out and get these anth this anthology out into the hands of people. And Red Hen is a small independent press, not so small, but independent at any rate, not a big multinational corporation. It's a definitely, I'm going to tell you as an independent publisher myself with Nightboat Books, it is a labor of love. You do not get compensated commensurate with the amount of work you're putting into. So please, you know, if you have the resources to, you know, you know, you all have your contributor copies, and I'm so grateful to you for your your contributions in general. But if it, you're moved to purchase additional copies as gifts, to give, tell people about it, share, arrange an event, you know, be in touch with my cat as Ria wants to say hi. Uh, be in touch with uh, Monica and Toby uh, to arrange to try to set up a reading. Let me know. I'm ha I'm happy to be there to participate um, in any anything you set up. But I hope that we can lift each other up and try to um, really, really get this anthology out there into the world. 
So I just want to close. We are a community now, and I want to um, bring in the voice of my teacher who's gone because I think he would love this moment. So I'm just gonna read you a poem by Aga Shahid Ali, the great, that great human, great mind, great writer, great human. Uh, read a short poem to close, which is my hope for all of us here. It's called Stationary. You may know this poem, Stationary. The moon did not become the sun. It just fell on the desert in great sheets reams of silver handmade by you. The night is your cottage industry now. The day is your brisk emporium. The world is full of paper. Write to me. Thanks everybody for coming and for sharing your beautiful work. And I hope that we all reconnect, connect and reconnect uh, in the coming weeks and months in, in other readings. Keep your eyes on the Red Hand New Moons page for to see the readings that are coming up. Uh, subscribe on Twitter uh, to, 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 you know, to, to, to be kept abreast in the loop. And if you too have not yet planned a reading, uh, uh, please be in touch with Monica and uh, we're gonna make all of that happen. Thank you so much, Kazem. This was unbelievable. Um, Again, don't forget if you purchase a copy of New Moons tonight or tell your friends to purchase a copy um, before November 16, then they'll get free shipping. Um, so super, super great perk. Um, and for the contributors who haven't had, who haven't received their copies yet, just let me know. Um, we might have sent it to the wrong address or something like that. So uh, just reach out and we'll get a copy to you ASAP for sure. Um, we just have a few housekeeping things to take care of, so bear with us as we wrap up on Red Hens. And um, we hope you enjoyed tonight's reading and our celebration of this incredibly important collection. It was beautiful hearing everybody's work, and it was so nice to finally see um, some faces to name. So I'm, I'm so happy to have been able to gather so many contributors in one place at the same time. Um, if you liked what you saw and you think more books like this should be available, please consider joining Red Hen in our mission to bring underrepresented and diverse literature to the world. As Kazem said, it's always a labor of love. And we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, so we need your help. So um, buy, buy more copies of these books, give them out to friends, tell people about Red Hen, um, and you can uh, visit our website for more information on how you can get involved with um, everything else that we're doing. So we have, as, as also as Cosm said, we have plenty more New Moons events coming up arranged by so many of you. Um, so keep an eye on the New Moons book page on redhen.org uh, and save the date for the next few events coming up this month. There are, I want to say at least three or four, if not five more kind of on deck over the next couple of weeks. Um, so happy to be a part of it and so happy to have been able to help facilitate however, um, however I can. Um, so this was Red Hen's last official Hen House at Home virtual event for the year, but we are back in person next Friday at the Hen House Literary Center in Pasadena. So if you're in the LA area, uh, we absolutely invite you to join us Friday, November 12th. We will welcome presidential inaugural poet Richard Blanco, Los Angeles poet laureate Lynn Thompson, and renowned poet and winner of the Red Hen Press Nonfiction Award, Jan Beatty, for an incredible reopening party with music by Dr. Ray Briggs of the Pasadena Conservatory of Music. Light refreshments will also be served. Um, just as a reminder, we do ask that all attendees be fully vaccinated, uh, and we will need to check that at the door, so have those vax cards ready. Um, that's it for us. Thank you again. Congratulations to all of you incredible contributors. It has been, and like, I, I love kind of hopping onto our Twitter and seeing all of these like tags of people receiving their copies and being like, this is the first time I've ever been published. Or um, even if it's like the 50th time you've been published, like the excitement of all of you just makes, uh, makes all of the work kind of worth it. This is what, this is why we do what we do. Um, it has been an honor kind of being able to bring this 
such an important um, volume to, to life. So thank you again. It was an incredible evening. Enjoy the rest of it. Um, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Good night, everybody.